you all ready to get the word of God this morning? Huh? So we are reading through the Old Testament. We've read through uh, the first five books of the Bible. And uh, this past week, we finished reading through Joshua. And so this morning, we'll be in the book of Joshua. If you would stand for the honor of reading God's word, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 24, starting with verse 1. Now Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Naor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. And I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it, and afterwards I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, And you came out to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt, and you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land. And I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the leaders of Jericho fought against you. And also the Amorites, the Barisites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I gave them into your hand, and I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you. The two kings of the Amorites, it was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you land on which you had not labored, and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity... And in faithfulness, put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, God. Convict us and give us the conviction to stand boldly and declare that for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Lord, no matter what others may do, no matter what the culture may look like, no matter what they may say, may we stand boldly with you. So God, give us that spirit of Joshua and of Caleb, God, that we will follow you. And Lord, if there's someone today here that needs to trust in you, that needs to place their faith and hope in you, I pray that you speak to them so they may call upon your great name. Lord, I do understand that there is a strict judgment on my life and rightly dividing your word truth, and I accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, in his name that I preach. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. To choose. To choose. Choose means... To pick out or select someone or something as being the best or most appropriate of two or more alternatives. I have options. Which one's the best? I'm going to choose. We make choices every day. You go to the restaurant. You sit down to eat. You make a choice. What are you going to drink? Now, I like to drink. I'm a Diet Coke guy. I like Diet Coke. I prefer that, but sometimes you go into the restaurant and you say, take a Diet Coke, and what do they say? Ah, uh, we don't serve uh, Coke here, we have Diet Pepsi though, will that be okay? And I have to admit, I'm not, a, I'm not that strong of a hard commitment 
toe the line coat guy, I say, sure, that'll be fine. It's kind of wishy-washy, really, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to like Coke, you should stick with Coke. Be like, nope, can't have it. Wishy-washy. You know what I mean by wishy-washy, right? Kind of one foot in, one foot out. Ah, take it or leave it. It's fine. I'm afraid we have too many Christians that are Coke, Pepsi. I just wish you wash. You can take it, leave it. I'll be a Christian when it's convenient. If I'm around other people that are Christians, yeah, I don't care to admit that I'm a Christian. But if I'm around other people that are a little against it, then I'll kind of be silent. Now, if you're a diehard UK fan, somebody gives you a UK sweatshirt, what will you do? Well, you'll wear that with pride, UK. If somebody gives you a Duke sweatshirt, you'll throw it away or burn it. Or maybe come out tonight and, throw, and we'll throw axes at it, right? I mean, we could do that. But, like, there's no true diehard UK fan that's going to be given a Duke shirt that's going to wear it. You're just not going to do it, right? Because it's like, I, you know, no, no, I will not. Wear a do shirt. That's kind of where we need to be. We need to be Christians who aren't wishy-washy, who can take it or leave it, who can be, yeah, I'm in, I'm out, hot, cold, doesn't matter. We know what the Lord says about those who are hot and cold, who are lukewarm. They can just take it or leave it. It makes him sick. Now, Joshua is ending his life. He's about to end, end his life. And uh, he's at the last years. And he brings the whole people of Israel together at Shechem. Now, Shechem was where Abraham built an altar to the Lord. That is where he, he was given uh, that, that affirmation of that covenant that I'm going to bless you and increase you and multiply you. So Abraham there first built an, an altar there to God. It was where Jacob comes back to and denounces all of the household gods. And buries them in the earth and renews his covenant before God to say, I'm going to follow the Lord. And so it's only fitting that Joshua now comes and gathers the people back here at Shechem as a valley of decision and to renew the covenant. Now when we notice that, when we read through verses 1 through 13, if you've been reading your Bible... All of those stories and the things that God said that he did should sound very familiar to you. And the Lord is speaking through Joshua, and the Lord is reminding them of his great love and power that he had upon his people. Did you notice as we read how God was bringing out the fact of what he has done for them? It wasn't that they were skillful and powerful and mighty, the reason why they entered into this land. No, it was because of his bow, not by their authority. Did you notice he reminded them about when they were in bondage to, to Pharaoh in Egypt? It wasn't they themselves that got them free, but it was God who delivered them. And so God is going through a history there of how he has been dealing with his people and bringing his people through the wilderness fighting for them, defeating their enemies to bring them to the promised land, saying, this is what I've done for you. This is how I have loved you. This is how I have protected you. This is all that I've done for you. And because of that, that should cause us to want to follow him and serve him and worship him. Amen? That choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to go back to the false gods? Abraham, when Abraham was, was there, God called him out. It was something that God did. God, his father was worshiping false deities and false gods. And God called to Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to leave your family. And I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. It was all by the grace of God, the power of God, the might of God. And so he brings them to the decision to say, are you going to go back and serve false gods? Or are you going to serve the God who has taken you and made you a people and brought you into the promised land? And Joshua says, 
no matter what you all decide to do, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We need folks today in America and our churches today to have that type of attitude. What do you think? We have to be bold. Now, let's go back to verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. This morning, what I want to try to argue this morning and convince you of is this. We need to choose to follow the Lord wholly, sincerely, faithfully, and intentionally. We must choose to follow the Lord wholly, sincerely, faithfully, and intentionally. Wholly. Completely, fully. There was two men in the book of Joshua that we read about. They had this type of attitude. One was Joshua himself. Now, if you read through Joshua, and may I just add, you need to be reading through us on this Bible reading plan because it really does make Sunday's message connect a little better. Because if you read through Joshua, here's what you're going to know about Joshua. He wasn't playing. He meant business. And when he went and conquered a territory, he conquered it. When he went and did what God called him to do, he wasn't wishy-washy. No, he went and actually did what God said to do. Look at what it says in chapter 11, verse 15. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, So Moses commanded Joshua. And so Joshua, follow with me, Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. I love that phrase. John, that could be a sermon title on its own. Leave nothing undone. I like that attitude. He left nothing undone. Everything that Moses commanded him to do, he did. He executed. God set the game plan, he executed. He did exactly what God had told him to do. And he did it wholly, sincerely, faithfully, and intentionally. He was a man on a mission. He was going to do what God told him to do. Another man in Scripture was, by the, was Caleb. Now, Caleb and Joshua, remember those two guys, when they were sent out to spy out the land, they were the two that came back and said, if we, we, can get, we, we can do this. If God's promised this land, this land is just like he told us it was. And if he said it, we can do it. Look what it says about Caleb in chapter 14, verse 7. Caleb is talking to Joshua and he's reminding Joshua of the promise that Moses had for him for the territory that was going to be theirs. Because when we read Joshua, we read a lot about how he, they, were, they were dividing up the land between all the tribes. And so Caleb reminds Joshua of the land that he was promised. And he says this, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers, who went up with me, made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot is trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses. While Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. Man, don't you love that attitude? Don't you love that attitude? Uh, As you get older, you kind of appreciate that, right? He's now 85 years old, and he says, I'm as strong today as I was back when I was 40 years old, and God told me that I could have this hill country, so he tells Joshua, I want this mountain, and I'm going to take it. 
If God's with me, I can possess it. I want everything that God said he was going to give me. We got to have Christians that have that type of attitude that says, whatever God's promised me, that's mine. And if he said I can have it, I can have it. And if he said he will do it, he'll do it. I'm not going to rest. I'm taking that mountain. And so Caleb has this attitude. He is going to follow God wholly, sincerely, faithfully, and intentionally. We need more people like that in the world today. We need, we need men like, like Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was, could have been a doctor, could have had all kinds of wealth in his life, but God called him into the mission field, and he sent him to an indigenous people group that had never heard the gospel before, and he goes in there. It is a hostile area, and people are saying, you're a fool. Why would you go and give up all of that? You have a nice career path. You could have lots of money. You could give financially to missions. You could do something else. But he said this. He made this quote. He, he is no fool. Who, can get, who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And he went over there. He was killed. He gave up his life for the gospel. But who was the fool? Is the fool the one that works and gives and gets and gains all through the world but yet loses his own soul? Or is it the one who gives up his, his life and gains his soul for all eternity? I think the fool is most people in America, not him. Many of us will spend our entire life working to gain and to possess and to have. And Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but yet forfeits his own soul? What good is all of that? What does this world have to offer? We need men like William Tyndale. If you have a Bible that's in English, you need to thank men like him. William Tyndale lived in the 1500s, and his main goal in life was to translate the Bible into the English language. It was illegal to do that, even there in England, but he was bound and determined that the people needed the, uh, the gift of being able to read the Word of God in their native tongue. It was in Latin, but it hadn't been translated in English yet, and it was illegal to do so, but he did it anyway. It's reported in, in a historical uh, documents that about him that he was sitting over dinner with a priest one day, and he said, "It is my aim and my goal to make the plowboy as uh, to know more theology than you." He felt like every single person should have the opportunity to hear the truth of God's word. And he gave his life up for it. He was put in prison a year and a half. They bring him out. They strangle him to death. And they burn him at the stake. Before he was killed, he uttered this prayer. Lord, open the eyes of the king. We need women who are not ashamed of the gospel we need some more praying mamas, what do you think? We need some praying grandmothers that get on their knees and praying for their children to know the Lord. We need men and women who are not ashamed to stand up and proclaim the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Men and women who follow God wholly, sincerely, faithfully, and intentionally. Let's go back to the verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord your God, serve him in sincerity. Sincerity means completeness with integrity, wholeness, without hypocrisy is what it means. And in faithfulness, put away the gods that your father served beyond the river in Egypt to serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we're going to what? Serve the Lord. What is God doing as he's speaking to the people? He's reminding them of his power, of his might, of his grace, of what he has done for them. 
And he says, this is how I've loved you. This is how I've protected you. This is where I have brought you. Then he calls them to a decision. Joshua says, choose this day who you will serve. Choose. We must make a choice every day who we will serve. Am I going to choose to serve the Lord this day or am I going to choose to serve self? Am I going to live this day to honor God or am I going to live this day to honor self? Am I going to live this day to glorify His name or am I going to make this day about my name? The New Testament speaks similarly to us as he did to the people of Israel. When we think about what God has done, where he has brought us, the New Testament reminds us of who we were and what we were like before we met Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, Paul reminds the church And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Let's stop right there just for a moment. Paul's reminding every believer of what your life was like before you became a Christian. You were disconnected from God. You were serving false deities. You were serving false gods. Your sinful flesh. That's where you were. You, we were like Abraham and his family that was serving other gods and false deities but look what happened in verse 4 but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us who loved us? he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace have you been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What's Paul reminding us of? Who saved us? Who loved us before we loved him? He did. I'm going to get down here just a little bit because that rain just seems to be, uh, it ain't going to outpower me. You ready? Are you with me? Stay with me. Don't go to sleep. Just thank God we're under protection. We need the rain. What does he say there? But God, being rich in mercy, who had the mercy? Who had the love? Who saved us? Did we save ourselves? He saved us. And because he saved us and because his grace was so overwhelming, we should follow him. How? Holy. Sincerely. Faithfully. And intentionally. Put away the gods. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you were bought with a price. So glorify God. How? How? In your body, you were bought with a price. What was that price? Talk to me, church. What was the price? Jesus' blood. You were bought with the precious blood of Jesus, Peter said. Not with gold and silver that can perish, but the imperishable blood of Jesus. You know what Jesus says about decisions? Remember, choose this day 
who you'll serve. Here's what he says, Luke eleven twenty three: 23. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. You know what he says? He says, you're either going to be with me or against me. It's not wishy-washy. It's not take it or leave it. You're either going to be a part of my kingdom's work and you're going to lead people to me and you're going to be a follower of me and you're going to worship me and serve me and honor me. And if, if you're not doing that, you're scattering. You're either for me or against me. It's not take it or leave it. It's not convenience. It's not chameleon Christianity. Where we just blend in in the environment we're in. No, it's either you're for me or against me. And Jesus draws that line in the sand and says, choose you this day. If you don't want to serve the Lord, fine. You don't have to serve the Lord. If you don't want to honor Jesus with your life, you don't have to. You can go serve yourself and all the other philosophies and serve all the other false gods that are out there uh, that, are, that are available today. You can go to Barnes and Noble and go through the bookshelves and just pick whatever you want to believe in and hold that to be your truth. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He says, if you're not with me, you're against me. You scatter. Jesus, in his teaching, he was teaching them about how he was the bread of life. He says, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, but they all died. He said, I am the true bread from heaven, and if you will eat of me, you will never die. He, he, he goes on, and he begins making statements that are very hard for people to receive. He says, he says this, he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood... You cannot be my disciple. That sounds a little strange. Jesus was not saying that they had to literally eat his flesh and literally drink his blood. Jesus was calling them to a full commitment. One where they were to serve him wholly, sincerely, faithfully, and intentionally. And he gave him a choice. And here's what the Bible says in verse 66. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter says, there's nowhere else to turn to, Jesus. You're the truth. You're the Messiah. You're the one that's come to save the world. We believe in you. We don't have anywhere else to go. Amen. No, we choose you. I choose to follow you, Jesus. Jesus had an encounter with the rich young ruler. You all know this story. There was a rich young ruler... Uh, he was Jewish, he knew the law, and he came to Jesus and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments, and he begins to quote some of the commandments, and the young man gets a little excited because he says, I have followed those ever since I have been young, and then Jesus says to him, here's what you need to do, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, then you will have treasure in heaven. And the Bible tells us that this young man's face fell. He, he dropped his face because he was unwilling to give up all to follow Jesus. He loved his wealth more than the invitation to the kingdom. And here's what the scripture says. He walked away. And guess what Jesus let him do? Walk 
away. He didn't chase him down and say, oh, whoa, you know, wait a minute, you know, got to get our numbers up, you know. We didn't really mean, I didn't really mean everything. You know, just, just whatever, just whatever's on your heart or, uh, you know, just whenever you feel like it. Because when Jesus calls us to follow him, he doesn't call us to follow him wishy-washy. One foot in, one foot out. Straddling the fence. No, we got to be all in. Holy. Sincerely. Faithfully. And intentionally. We have to put away the false gods. And we got to follow the one true God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters. For either, he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. You cannot serve God in money. You cannot serve God in self. You cannot serve God in sin. You cannot serve God in political correctness. You cannot serve God in the cultural uh, belief system. You serve Jesus. Period. It's not, I like this part, I'll take this part, and I'll leave this part out. Here's what James says, James 4, 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've been born again, then the Holy Spirit of God lives in your heart and he is jealous over the things of God. And he will not allow you to pursue a life apart from pleasing and honoring the Lord. His desire is that we serve the Lord wholly, sincerely, faithfully, and what? Intentionally. And he draws them to a point of decision. He says, you got to decide. Are you going to serve the gods of your forefathers? Are you going to serve the gods of Egypt? Are you going to serve the false gods of the people of the land that we just defeated? If it seems evil in your sight to follow the Lord, then go back to the false gods. But as for me and my house, Joshua says, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, I, I don't know what y'all going to do, but I know what I'm going to do. Uh, and I know what I, I'm going to lead my house to do. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to serve political correctness. We're not going to serve our, what the social media is advancing in our culture, relativism, whatever it might be. We're going to serve Jesus. Now, I know we've, are, we've already gotten texts from you all. And we do know what's going on. We do know that they've got a drag show planned in our community. We know that. We're aware of that. If you're a man, and, and, and if you want to wear women's clothing, go ahead, but as for me and my house... We're going to serve the Lord. And if that's what you want to do, then you, you do that. But I, I'm going to serve the Lord. Amen. Do whatever you want to do. God's not going to make you serve him. You can go back to the false gods. 
You can go back to the gods of Egypt. You can go back and live, live however you want to. God's not going to force you, but I'm telling you, God means business. And J Joshua, when he came in and he conquered, he conquered. And Jesus is the Joshua who will conquer. Now, I need to say some things. In love, not in hate, but I need to correct some things because our young people are being brainwashed by social media. I don't need anybody clapping after this. Do not clap. You ready? Do not clap. Just don't clap. Just, just listen. There is no such thing as a gossip Christian. There's no such thing as an adulterer Christian. Okay? Just listen, listen. There's no such thing as gay Christian. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Now, you may be a Christian who battles a gossiping tongue that you must put to death every day. You might be a Christian who battles sexual temptation of opposite sex attraction that you must put to death every day. You might even be someone who battles same-sex attraction, but that must be put to death. But nowhere in Scripture does it allow for us to embrace a sinful lifestyle and say that that is okay. No, what the Bible tells us is we must repent of our sin. Do you know what the word repent means? It means to turn from. It's a 180 degree turn, not a 360. Not one right back to the spot you just came from. It's a 180. It's going one direction, stopping and saying, this is a dead end. This life is not good. This life is filled of heartache, pain, suffering. Oh, they tell me it's full of pleasure. Oh, they tell me it's full of fun. They tell me it's full of excitement, but in the end, it bites like a snake. And so I, I believe what Jesus offers is so much better that he can forgive me of my sin. He can free me from my lust. He can free me from my pride. He can free me from my, my desires. And he can save me by his grace and turn me into a different direction where I walk in his love and his joy and his peace and his patience and his kindness and his gentleness. And I live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Not wishy-washy. Parents, it's time for you to step up. It's summer. It's youth camp time. Oh, we will get all kinds of parents wanting to make sure their kid gets to go to youth camp. But I don't see him here every week. Where are you? You got me? Where are you? You think one week is going to be all they need? They need to be in the house of God every week. Oh, you're faithful taking them to the ball fields, to the ball court. What about here? What about the Word of God? Fathers? It's time for you to step up and be the man of your house and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't care what any other household's going to do, but in this house, we're serving Jesus. It doesn't matter what your friends are doing. In this house, we're serving Jesus. It don't matter what everybody else may think. We're serving the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Hey, it don't matter what your friends say. They can't save you. They didn't die for you. There's a God who loves you. 
There is a God who wants to free you. I don't want to be a chain to my passions. What about you? The number one God that America has to crucify right now is self. Man, there's so many people addicted to themselves on social media. It's crazy. You got to video every aspect of their life and put it out there like everybody needs to see what you're doing or thinking or saying. And we're living a false life. It's not real. It's time to get real. It's time to say, today I die to self. It ain't about me. Can you say that? It's not about me. Did you say that? It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose for your life. Submit to him. Follow him. Because you know what I've discovered? Jesus is all I need. He's enough. He's enough. This world, it really, I mean, I'm being honest. This world has absolutely nothing for me. There is not one thing that this world can give me that I can take with me when I, when I die. The accomplishments that I have after I die, people won't remember that. It's not going to matter how much money you have, what kind of house you had, what kind of car you drove. What's going to matter is, did you live a life in devotion to the Lord who made you, who created you? Do you love Him wholly, sincerely, faithfully, and intentionally? He said, put away the gods. I wonder if there's any false gods that need to be trashed today. I wonder if there's anything in your life that's hindering you from fully following the Lord. He says, Amen. Amen. That needs to be thrown away. Just get rid of it. Get rid of it. Your browsing history, get rid of it. Your friend groups, toxic, get rid of it. The books you read, toxic, get rid of it. The philosophy you're adopting, get rid of it. The education is corrupting. Whatever it might be, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. it. Put it away. Do it intentionally and follow Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we give you praise today and we give you thanks. This morning you call us to a decision. We can either continue to serve ourselves and the false gods that the world offers or today we can choose to follow you. Lord, I pray that, that you'd speak to hearts right now. If there's anyone that's wishy-washy, if there's anyone that's got one foot in, one foot out, they're kind of ah, kind of in, kind of out, I'll be, a, I'll be a believer when it's convenient. Lord, would you draw that to their mind and, and draw them to a decision today? Jesus, we believe you died and rose again and that you give life to everyone who repents of their sin and turns to you. So God, do your work today as we call upon your name. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.